We have a number of guide dogs in training uh, today. You're very welcome. Question number one, Joanne Lamont. I hope the presiding officer is as kind to me. Um, to ask the First Minister what engagements he has planned for the rest of the day. First uh, Minister. Presiding officer, I think it's appropriate to mark that we've all been saddened by the news of the death of Angus MacLeod, one of Scotland's most experienced political journalists. He'll be missed by members across the chamber and, of course, his colleagues in the press corps. And our condolences go to Angus's family and friends at this very sad time. John Lamont. Can I agree absolutely wholeheartedly with what the First Minister has said? We have lost a true friend of Scotland and a man who was able, in such wonderful terms, to capture um, the politics of our country and indeed his humanity was known to us all. It's true that, is it true that Abilio, who have won the right to run Scotland's railways, were more expensive for Scotland's taxpayers than other bidders, as has been reported in the press? If so, how much more is this deal costing the people of Scotland? Minister? Uh, no, this is by some distance the best uh, value uh, bid uh, in terms of running Scotland's railways. It offers a, a substantial number of, of advantages uh, and I think uh, Scotland uh, will see the benefits from that over the franchise periods. Uh, of course, uh, it's not just uh, members of the government assessing the, the bids who have been impressed by Abelia's bid. Uh, Jenny Mara, the North East of Scotland MSP, says, I was impressed that they'd taken the trouble to meet me. They had done their research. They recognised we were running the campaign. They were the only franchisee who got in touch about our campaign. That gives me encouragement. Uh, so I, I think both in terms of the proper assessment of the bids and in terms of the widespread support and encouragement that Abelia seemed to have managed to generate, uh, I think we can look forward to improved terms for Scotland's railways and in particular improved terms and conditions for the staff working in Scotland's railways. John Lamont. Well, that was a yard-long answer, but didn't answer the question I asked him. I asked him, is it the deal costing the people of Scotland more? We got a lot of words, we didn't get an answer. We know price is extremely important. We live in extremely straitened times in terms of the public finances and it's our responsibility to make sure we get value for the money. Not my words, but Keith Brown, Transport Minister, um, speaking on the 20th March 2012. He doesn't seem to have applied the same rules. When the government says that this deal will involve new rolling stock, can I ask the First Minister this? Other than the new trains already promised for the Glasgow to Edinburgh route, when Abelio talk about new trains, do they really mean new rolling stock or do they mean refurbished trains, some of which may be decades old? First Minister. Well, I think the, uh, the new trains uh, between Edinburgh and Glasgow and completion of the EGIP are actually rather important for the commuters going between Edinburgh and Glasgow. The refurbishment of the trains and the rolling stock is of vital importance for commuters uh, across Scotland. Can we just point out in the terms of the value for money, what we can expect from this new contract? Faster services between all the cities, up to 12-minute journey time saving between Edinburgh, Glasgow, Perth and Inverness. Popular high-speed diesel trains between the Central Belt and Inverness and Aberdeen linking all of our seven cities with free Wi-Fi, increased comforts, galley and all-seat catering and more luggage space. The new electric chains between Edinburgh and Glasgow, which Joanne Lamont doesn't seem to think are very important, but I think are absolutely vitally important. New trains in the Central Belt, new stations across Scotland, more capacity in our trains, 20 to 24 per cent increase in seats at peak time services, which I think is a particularly vital aspect. Now, these were the characteristics uh, which decided the bid and the franchise in Abelia's favour. But I must say, I'm impressed by the fact of the offer and the commitment to make sure that the living wage is paid to all the rail staff. As Joanne Lamont knows, this government introduced the living wage in the public sector in Scotland. Uh, and therefore, to have a commitment to extend the living wage, not just through the direct railway staff, but through the subcontractors, that's the, the cleaners and the catering staff, I, I think is a substantial enhancement of delivery in Scotland. Because both in terms of customer satisfaction and usage, and in terms of treating the staff in our railways with respect, that, to me, is a considerable advance. John Lamont. Maybe you can get back to me later about the question I asked him. 
I would also say that on the living wage, of course, the government had it in its own hands to make sure that every worker, every worker benefiting from a public sector procurement um, offer would have had the living wage if they only had the courage of their convictions. Cheap words, but not action. And of course, this great company that we've been told about, the First Minister may not be aware, came 18th out of 18 in a survey by which where they expressed concerns about cleanliness and value for money. Now, Mick Whelan, the General Secretary of the Train Drivers Union, ASLEV, said of this deal, and I quote, it's a particularly perverse decision by the SNP government in Scotland, which was arguing for independence and is getting more devolved powers to embrace privatisation and all that means, and is getting many more devolved powers to embrace privatisation. Order. You just Order. listen. Order, it's Ms Lamont that's listen. asking the questions. And I'm quoting Mick Whelan, the General Secretary of the Train Drivers Un Union, ASLEV. And all that means, rather than wait a few months, take a fresh look at the opportunities for real services in Scotland, and then, and then, instead of acting in such a precipitate fashion, make a considered decision next year. Can the First Minister tell me which part of that statement is wrong? First Minister. <laughs> Uh, a little bit uh, of history. L Labour Party had the opportunity when in government, uh, when looking at railway legislation, to give this parliament the Order. power to introduce public sector bids from this country into the railways, but refused to do so. <laughs> Throughout the term of office of this government, the Scottish government have consistently requested that power to be transferred to this parliament so as that we could affect it. We currently have the situation that that is now supported by the Labour Party, who did nothing about it in government, opposed by their friends and colleagues in the Better Together Alliance and the Conservative Party. And if it was now to be transferred, if we are to believe the vow that requires the guarantee of a mass petition of the people of Scotland to deliver it, if we are to believe the vow, it would take at least five or six years to bring it into legislative operation. Over that period of time, it is the ScotRail franchise that would have to be extended and the profits to that franchise that the Labour Party or some of their members have been complaining about over recent times. So Joanne Lamont's position seems to be that we should hope that the powers will be transferred despite the fact that our friends and colleagues in the Conservative Party don't agree with it. And in the meantime, for the next five or six years, we have to extend the current franchise with all of its inadequacies, as opposed to getting better terms and conditions for the railway staff of Scotland and getting better services for the people of Scotland. If this is the relaunch of the Labour Party, then I think it's going to reach the end of the tracks very soon indeed. Joanne Lamont. Order. I saw what the First Minister did there, that was really, really funny. Um, on the question of asking for these powers, the First Minister also, of course, should reflect. He made six key demands to the Scotland Bill as the Calman process went through the UK government. Not one of those demands talked about the railways. Not one of them. So don't pretend it was something he was concerned about. It seems, it seems that the First Minister's answer is simply there is nothing he can do. As power seeps from him, the First Minister still wants more powers. As power seeps from him, the First Minister still wants more powers, but still spends his life telling us what he cannot do. Why could he not wait for a few months and look at how we... And look at how Order. we... And look at how we, with a successor, could improve Scotland's railways. Why choose a deal which is more expensive for Scotland? Why settle for decades-old trains? Wasn't the RMT General Secretary Mick Cash right when he said, all you're seeing in private ownership is that money is being sucked out of the industry and given to the private sector shareholders, or in this case, is going to go to subsidise the Dutch railways? Why? Why? 
is the First Minister spending his last days in office selling out Scotland rather than standing up for Scotland? First Minister. Order. First Minister. Can I just say to John Lamont, it's not a few months. It would be five years to bring these powers from Westminster to Scotland to put them into operation to conduct a new franchise. Not a few months. And then you'd have to persuade your friends and colleagues and allies in the Better Together campaign to support you. I don't know if Joanne Lamont ever said during the Better Together campaign, can we not unite Conservative Order. and Labour in transferring the power over the railways to Scotland? No. We want that power. We want that power to transfer. Keith Brown has written three times to the present UK government asking that power to be transferred in the long years okay, of Okay, just Labour let's government. settle down, please. The power didn't get transferred. Joanne Lamont didn't even mention it in a relaunch speech last night. So dramatically important. What we've got from this contract in addition to the increased terms and conditions for uh, the staff of our, our railways, which I think is so important in terms of the solidarity uh, of this country. We've got improved terms and conditions for the railway passengers of Scotland, as I've laid out in very considerable terms. And that improved and enhanced railway service in Scotland seems to me a good and better deal than waiting and hoping that the friends and allies of Joanne Lamont and the Conservative Party are suddenly going to have a transformation and agree with us that that power should be come to Scotland so that we can have not for profit or public sector bids from Scotland as well as public sector bids from the Netherlands. And in the meantime, we'll get on with the job of running Scotland's railways, expanding passenger numbers, enhancing services, reducing fares, and making sure that the staff of our railways have a better future in this new contract. Question number two, Ms. Davidson. Thank you, Presiding Officer. And may I add the condolences of myself and my party to the family of Angus MacLeod, who wrote with a, a clarity and a humanity which added hugely to the political life of Scotland. And may I ask the First Minister when he'll next meet the Secretary of State for Scotland? Uh, no plans, near future. Ms. Davidson. Last week, the First Minister got caught out pretending that the Commonwealth Games was the reason why his government had cut health spending in Scotland. Despite this being exposed as arrant nonsense, the First Minister continued to claim that over the last five years, and I quote, National Health Service spending in Scotland has increased in real terms. Does he still hold that view? First Minister. Uh, our commitment has always been to resource spending. That was the commitment in our manifesto, and every single penny of uh, consequentials have been devoted to the National Health Service uh, in Scotland. That is why, in spite of the 7.2% real terms Westminster cut, we have ensured that National Health Service Scotland revenue will increase by 4.2% in real terms over the period 2009-10 to 2015-16, a very considerable achievement in the face of the draconian cutbacks from Westminster. Ruth Davis. Oh. After last week, I thought I'd double check whether, as the First Minister has just said a moment ago, every single penny of consequentials has indeed been passed on. And this time we double checked with the Parliament's own independent and impartial information service. And guess what? Looking at health spending over the last five years, they concluded that the figures show a drop in spending, and I will quote again, equivalent to a 1.2% fall in the health budget in real terms. That is hundreds of millions of pounds. Their analysis also notes these figures do not include sport. So the First Minister's Commonwealth Games excuse is rubbish, and it's been shown to be rubbish twice. The Independent Institute of Fiscal Studies says he's cut health spending in real terms. The Independent Parliamentary Information Service says he's cut health spending in real terms. The First Minister has got it wrong. His Health Secretary has got it wrong. Everyone can see they have got it wrong. And hundreds of millions of pounds that they promised to Scotland's NHS has never been delivered. Will the First Minister finally set the record straight and just admit it. First Minister. Well, uh, actually, it's just Ruth Davidson who's got it wrong. This is the SNP manifesto, 2011, page 14. 
We recognise we want to have a first-class health service in Scotland. The resources need to be there. That's why we have guaranteed the revenue budget of the Scottish National Health Service will be protected in real terms. We have never expressed it in anything other than the resource budget. Now, the mistake that the IFS made was to increase resource and capital. Uh, that is not the commitment we gave. And very simple reason for that, and that is the capital budget has been slashed from Westminster, and therefore we have devised a new mechanism, the non-profit distribution mechanism, uh, in order to make sure that we can continue to invest in the infrastructure of the National Health Service in Scotland. And we now find out that the Institute of Fiscal Studies forgot to include NPD spending in their analysis, which, which is actually quite important given that it's going to amount through the hub and NPD of £380 million in the next financial year alone. So now it's been explained to Ruth Davidson that the mistake the IFS made was not to include NPD spending, then I'm sure she's reassured that unlike south of the border, the National Health Service in Scotland is in safe hands. Why do we know it's not in safe hands south of the border? This, the bombshell letter across the National Health Service, the National Health Service time bomb letter, National Health Service and Social Care Service are at breaking point. It cannot go on. Every area of the National Health Service in England writing to the Prime Minister, pointing out the consequences of Tory policies. Not just the extraordinary pressure on health service budgets, which we have as well in Scotland, but as they put it, the top-down reorganisation, which has dismayed staff and fragmented the health service in England. That's why the National Health Service is safe in public hands in Scotland. A commitment to expenditure and a commitment above all to a National Health Service safe in public hands in Scotland. The question, Rob Gibson. Thank you, President Officer. To ask the First Minister for an update on the reported fire aboard the MV Parida in the Murray Firth, which was carrying nuclear waste from Scrabster to Antwerp, which led to it drifting dangerously and subsequently required towage to sheltered waters for repair yesterday. And what lessons must be learned? First Minister. Well, can I say that this incident, uh, well, firstly, we should say the, there was no release of radioactivity. The radioactive waste was in cement, high quality containers, uh, and therefore there was no significant or no release of radioactivity uh, as far as we can determine from this instance. So people should be reassured about that. However, the member is right to attribute and to focus concern. The MV Parada had a funnel fire in the Murray Firth around 8 p.m. on Tuesday evening and was subsequently drifting for some hours. The Beatrice oil platform had to be evacuated as a precaution although the vessel's anchor, anchor slowed its drift. The Pereira was carrying a load of radioactive waste being returned from Dunray to Belgium. A tow took the Pereira to safe anchorage in the Cromarty Firth on Wednesday morning. The concerns that this incident raises are obvious. It was Scottish Government uh, authorities who had to coordinate to make sure that this incident was safely uh, ensured. But unfortunately, the Office of Nuclear Regulation had not had sufficient consultation with these authorities before this incident took place. It is significantly unsatisfactory to find that boats carrying consignments of nuclear waste have to wait for a weather window in October in the North Sea in order to carry forward uh, their trip. It is also of significant concern that what is apparently a minor incident in a boat of this kind can result in it being totally without power with the consequences, obviously, of the evacuation of an oil platform as a result. I think, therefore, this whole chamber uh, should unite in looking for the devolution of the relevant authority to make sure that Scotland has the power not just to handle these incidents, but to make sure, as far as possible, they don't occur in the first place. Question three, Christine Graham. Thank you, Presiding Officer. To ask the First Minister what the Scottish Government's position is on Police Scotland's National Child Abuse Investigation Unit. First Minister. Well, we welcome this positive move by Police Scotland. The new National Child Abuse Unit will provide special investigative resources to lead or assist with complex or high-profile child abuse investigations. 
It will allow Police Scotland to work in a more structured way in relation to child abuse, which is not confined by geographical boundaries. It also demonstrates, I think, a clear commitment to child protection in Scotland. I thank the First Minister for his answer. Uh, grooming is often a precursor to abuse and sexual abuse, but is often only detected once that subsequent sexual crime is committed. Is he aware that currently, if a child is groomed in Scotland and the resultant sexual offence or abuse takes place out with the UK, for example in France, that crime and the grooming can be prosecuted here? But if the abuse takes place anywhere else in the UK, only the grooming can be prosecuted here. Given that the Lord Advocate has raised concerns about this and the Cabinet Secretary has advised that the Government is considering legislation to end this lacuna, can the First Minister provide any further detail on when legislation might be brought forward so that both crimes could be prosecuted here? First Minister. I mean, yes, I can, because the, the Member raises an important issue about how our justice system can deal with uh, child sexual offences. It is important, though, to remember this does not mean that sexual offences against children cannot be prosecuted. However, at present, she is correct. They can only be prosecuted in part of the UK where the offence was committed. So, for example, offences committed in England can only be prosecuted in England, and they cannot be prosecuted by law currently in Scotland. The Scottish Government Ministerial Working Group on Child Sexual Exploitation, which reported earlier this year, considered there is a case for extending the extraterritorial effect of sexual offences against children to include offences committed elsewhere in the United Kingdom, so that they can be prosecuted in Scotland if that is the best place to conduct the prosecution. The Scottish Government agrees with this recommendation. We intend to bring forward legislative change when there is a suitable legislative opportunity. Graham Pearson. Thank you, President Officer. I too welcome the introduction of the new unit, particularly in terms of its prevention responsibility along with the Crown Office. In that light, would the First Minister reconsider a decision not to have a public inquiry into historic child abuse, as such an inquiry would gather evidence that would help in the preventative efforts that this unit will make? First Minister. I think we should concentrate on the unit and the investigation. I think the important thing about the investigation unit, of course, is it's not there just to investigate and prevent future child abuse. It's also there to investigate historic child abuse. And therefore, we have within Police Scotland being formed a unit with the appropriate expertise uh, to take forward uh, any legitimate uh, inquiry. Uh, there was, I, I thought, very good evidence from uh, Assistant Chief Constable Malcolm Graham when he appeared before the Justice Committee on the 7th of October, and he clarified and laid out in substantial terms uh, in recent days uh, how the unit will perform. It will draw on existing resources across the country and have that continuity. The unit will be fully up and running by the end of this year. The new unit will take a similar approach to the, the National Rape Task Force, which has seen specialist officers brought in and rape investigations put on a par with murder. It will allow Police Scotland to work in a, a fundamentally more structured way in relation to child abuse, and I think that's going to be helpful. And I know this unit and the seriousness with which Police Scotland take this matter will be supported across the Chamber. Question four, John Mason. To ask the First Minister what action the Scottish Government is taking to tackle the stigma surrounding mental health issues. First Minister. Well, this is a priority for the Scottish Government. It has been so for many years. It continues to be so. It's one of the, the seven key themes of our mental health strategy, extending anti-stigma agenda forward to include further work and discrimination. CME was, was founded in 2002 and was internationally recognised as a groundbreaking campaign. In November 2013, we built on that good work and launched a refunded programme jointly with Comet Relief for an investment of £1 million from the Scottish Government and £500,000 from Comet Relief. This is three times the original funding in 2002. Now, that refunded programme will focus on these areas where people say they're experiencing the most stigma and discrimination, including work in the health and the social care settings, to directly involve people who have lived through experience of mental health problems and become a, a, a true movement thus for change. John Mason. Yeah, I thank the First Minister for that answer. In my own constituency, I came across a considerable, amount, a considerable reaction from a minority of the community eh, when it was proposed to open a care home for people with mental health issues, which showed me that eh, stigma was still alive. Eh, would he commit his government to making mental health and education about it a real priority area until we overcome this? Yes, I, I mean, I think 
uh, and the answer I've just given, I hope, assures John Mason that that is the case, will continue to be the case. We acknowledge there is much work yet to be done, uh, but I, I think the, the refunded or refounded programme gives us encouragement that that is the uh, intention and that will be carried forward. Jim Hume. The First Minister and his government not just match the per capita, the extra four hundred million invested in NHS south of the border to tackle mental health, but also the extra one hundred and twenty million pounds per capita, of course, uh, announced this week to tackle mental health. First Minister. Well, I, I mean, I'll check the exact figures for the benefit of the member, but uh, there is record amounts being spent on mental health and the approach to mental health in the Scottish National Health Service, and I've just pointed out, in particular, the programme which John Mason asked about is now funded to a level of three times uh, the original funding from 2002. Uh, I, I think rather than you know, us have an argument about, uh, about exact figures on the matter, let's just unite to say this has to be a key priority in the National Health Service in Scotland and go forward on that basis. Question five, James Kelly. Thank you, Presiding Officer. To ask the First Minister what the Scottish Government's response is to reports that ScotRail has recorded uh, nearly £100 million in profit since 2008, with £95 million of that being paid to shareholders. First Minister. <laughs> well, they, uh, I, I, have to, uh, I have to confess to James Kelly that the Scottish Government have followed to the letter the legally binding franchise agreement, which we inherited in 2007 from the Labour Party. <laughs> Uh, under which we are required to make franchise payments to First ScotRail. Gibbs Kelly. The Abellio model is one that Scotland should aspire to, a public-run transport body able to bid for business all over Europe. Now that the Scottish Government have committed to a £6 billion 10-year contract where profits generated by Scottish rail passengers will be invested in Dutch public transport, how does the First Minister intend to progress an agenda which will promote public railways in Scotland, which would allow a public bid in the future and export Scottish services abroad. First by Minister. doing uh, what we've consistently done over the years by demanding these powers to be transferred to this Parliament to allow us to do so. <clears throat> I have to say, I, I, I'm not quite, I don't quite understand uh, James Kelly's tactics uh, uh, on this matter. I've already laid out to John Lamont that it would take five years to bring into being uh, a new contract. There is, of course, a break clause in the contract we've just negotiated uh, at five years, so we can hope in the future to make absolutely sure that this contract fulfils what we believe it, it can uh, do. But uh, in order to bring about uh, James Kelly's uh, wish uh, to change things substantially, he called in a parliamentary motion, I think, for us to suspend the contract negotiations uh, in the last week or two. Now, if we'd done so, uh, that would have cost perhaps 30 million in the base of the well, on the basis of the West Code contract suspension, it would have cost 55 million in compensation to the contract bidders. I'm not sure if that's what James Kelly wanted to happen. But what is even more interesting is his tactic of what was to happen in the meantime, while we waited for the uh, for the contract to be given and the powers to be given for Scotland. The argument was to extend the real contract forward. So James Kelly's strategy, as he gets furious about the profits being made by First Scotrail, to extend the contract to these disgraceful capitalists over a number of years and in the meantime have a less good service for the people of Scotland. You know, I wonder if there was going to be changes on the front bench of the Labour Party in the imminent future last week. I think with such talent in the back benches, it's only a matter of time before we have a wholesale change of timetable. Question six, Margot Fraser. Thank you. To ask the First Minister what the Scottish Government is doing to tackle overcrowding and understaffing in accident and emergency departments. First Minister. Well, the, the Scottish Government has supported the creation of local unscheduled care action plans for each health board to determine steps that each <coughs> accident and emergency should take to improve performance. This includes examining issues such as patient flow through hospitals, which goes beyond the accident emergency itself. And in August, we targeted an additional £5 million to help address patient flow in a number of hospitals. Uh, the most recent figures we have uh, for June 14, that is performance of major accident emergency departments, was 93.2% in Scotland, 92.8% in England, 
85.3% in Wales and 75.1% in Northern Ireland. That compares, and it's not what we want to see, because we want to get to the 95% target. But relatively, we're doing well in comparison to what's happening elsewhere in these islands. But of course, another pertinent comparison is with the 87.5% that the then Health Minister, Andy Kerr, hailed in 2006 as a magnificent achievement. So it does seem that under huge funding pressure, the accident and emergency departments across Scotland are performing better than their colleagues elsewhere in these islands, but also significantly better uh, than they were back in the, the dark days of 2006 when the Labour Party were in charge in Scotland. Margaret Fraser. Thank you. Well, can I thank the First Minister for his response? Well, can I reassure him that Mr Andy Kerr has nothing to do with me? Um, <laughs> but can I ask him, following on from the comments of Dr Martin McKechnie, who is the new chair of the College of Emergency Medicine, we said on Monday that A&E departments were dangerously overcrowded and struggling with fewer doctors. And the medical director of NHS Grampian, who said last week in Parliament that Scotland had fallen behind the rest of the world in terms of incentives to keep uh, medical practitioners. What is the Scottish Government doing to ensure that doctors are retained working in A&E? And what are they doing now to ensure that these A&E departments are adequately staffed? I, I'm glad that uh, that uh, member has cited Dr Martin McKechnie because he has been uh, foremost in praising the action that's been taken by the Scottish Government. Let me quote him exactly. There is a feeling within the specialty there is a turnaround in how things are in terms of care of patients within the emergency department environment. We have had a lot of support and investment in the last 18 months from the Government and we are beginning, I hope, to feel and see the effects of, of some of, of those changes. So Martin McKechnie, while acknowledging the huge pressure on our National Health Service acknowledges also the efforts of this Government uh, to cope and to deal with that vast increase in the number of patients and to treat people successfully uh, and safely. It, it then brings me to the comparison with what's happening south of the border. There is a National Health Service and social care services at breaking point. And the range of the specialties across south of the border, not just in accident and emergency, but in every area of medicine, they wrote to the UK government and indeed to the opposition leaders at Westminster pointing out these things and pointing out that the very last thing that the health service needs is a further top-down reorganisation causing chaos and dismay among health service staff. They certainly won't get that in Scotland. They'll get encouragement and support so that we can continue to build our national health service in public hands. Lewis MacDonald. Thank you very much. Does the First Minister agree with Dr Rolf Dykhausen, the outgoing medical director of NHS Grampian, when he said this week that uh, consultants in emergency medicine want to practice their skills in trauma and resuscitation, not to spend their time dealing with minor illnesses and injuries? Does he accept the point that Dr Dykhausen was making, that the recruitment crisis in A&E will not be resolved until primary care and GP services are adequately resourced in Grampian and everywhere else. First Minister. Oh, I, I think I certainly agree with the outgoing medical director uh, that there's been a historic imbalance uh, in funding for Grampian compared with Scotland uh, as a whole. That is why when we came to office, the funding of frontline services in Grampian was 9.1 per cent, if my memory serves me correctly, of the Scottish total. It is now heading towards 9.6%. In other words, the historical imbalance on the Arbuthnet formula, which we inherited from the Labour Party, has now year by year been closed. So at last, Grampian and the people of the northeast of Scotland can look forward to a health service which is funded fairly and properly. Of course, the legacy of his colleagues have left uh, with the Labour Party, the Grampian Health Service, underfunded in the past. Thank goodness, under this health secretary, that disparity is being sorted out and we can look forward with confidence for the future. That ends First Minister's question time. We are now moving to members' business. Members who leave the chamber should do so quickly and quietly.